Hello, welcome to the video and welcome to Terminal 3 again. Another beautiful day here in London. I'm midway through my tier point run to gather 720 tier points to renew my BA Gold status. And today I'm crossing the Atlantic. Now, I had the opportunity, obviously, to fly with British Airways, but I thought, no, I'll mix it up a bit and I'll fly with American Airlines to see what their product is like. So today I'll be flying from here with American Airlines in business class across to Boston. I have flown with American before, but that was before I had the channel, so I'm very interested to see if anything has changed. It was a solid product, decent food, good drink. The crew, though, were a little bit standoffish, although to be fair, both of the times I've flown with them, they were overnight flights back, where it's very difficult for any crew to be as perky as they perhaps are on a daytime flight. So if you'd like to see what American Airlines transatlantic business class product is like, stick around. Hi, I'm Matt, and this is Matt's Planet. I aim to entertain, educate and inspire with my travel adventures from planning to execution. I'll show you how you can travel in style for a lot less than you'd think. So subscribe so you can come with me. Into the terminal and I decided to stop by the check-in desks even though I was already checked in. I started this trip in Dublin and had received BA boarding passes all the way through to Los Angeles, but past experience taught me that airlines quite like you having boarding passes printed on their own stock. I also have TSA pre-clearance, proof of which is printed on the boarding pass, and I know the TSA can get picky if that proof of access isn't presented in a way they're used to. Fortunately there was no queue, so it was a very quick process from a very helpful agent. Indeed, she was so helpful, she recommended I skip the mediocre AA business class lounge and head to Cathay Pacifics instead. Fascinating that American Airlines staff will do this unprompted, even if it wasn't news to me. Check out this video for a review and ranking of all of the T3 lounges. Up the escalator to the fast track security, fully endowed with the new scanners which allow you to leave everything in your bag. It'll be a few more months before all of Heathrow's security lanes have this new equipment, but it's coming, and it's a day I very much look forward to. This was around 8am, and it was wonderfully quiet. I know Heathrow doesn't like these machines to be filmed, so you'll have to trust me that it was a quick and pleasant experience. I was renewing my gold status on this trip, so I had dropped to silver when I travelled. That meant I only had access to the business class lounges, but from making that lounge crawl video, I knew that the food available in the BA business lounge is almost identical to what's offered in the BA first lounge, so I headed there first, as I think they do the best breakfast of any of the lounges. And it didn't disappoint. The plates are small, but the food is pretty good. I then moved on to the Cathay Pacific Lounge, as recommended by AA's check-in staff, as it's a more pleasant space to linger than the BA Lounge. I'd noted that the Qantas Lounge was open, but without going in, I could see that the downstairs area wasn't yet in use. Cathay did offer Western breakfast options in their buffet, a fact I've filed away for future reference, but I think the BA spread was definitely superior. And before long it was time to board gate 34 today, which is one of the furthest gates from the lounges, so if your gate is in the 30s or 40s, allow plenty of time as it's a fair hike. It was very quiet at the gate, and it ended up being pretty quiet on the plane too. Boarding was called, and I was quickly on to this 24-year-old Boeing 777-200 series, albeit one which was reconfigured with Americans' newish business class seats in 2018. Two business cabins on this plane, four rows aft, and I was in the front row of this five row forward cabin. American adopts what I think is a strange numbering system. A seat 1L is actually on the right side of the cabin. This seat may look familiar as it's based on the same super diamond platform as BA's new club suite. As with BA's seats, couples will probably want a middle pair, although discuss anything important before boarding as it'll be trickier once on board. I thought the seat was nicely set up. A menu, some water, the amenity kit and the headphones are all laid out in front of the large screen. Doing it this way means you then have to find places to store everything, but I like being able to review everything as I settle in. The seat offers two personal storage bins as you get on BA. The forward one has a universal power plug, the remote for the entertainment system and two USBs next to the headphone socket. The rear bin is a lot shallower, but is great for phones, glasses and hearing aids. BA actually wraps another storage area around the literature slot, but AA hasn't, 
although the light is very familiar, as is the seat control panel. Unlike the same bins on BA, these seem to close and open without issue. There was also a blanket and a seat protector packaged on the seat, but I threw those in the overhead bins off camera and didn't actually retrieve them during the course of this flight. Above you are more lights and air vents, bonus marks for having them, and to your left is an armrest which goes up and down. The down position allows easier access to the seat when in bed mode and indeed when in seat mode. The big difference to the BA seat is that there's no sliding door. The frame of the seat is still substantial though, and the alignment of the seats gives you good privacy even without a door. Other than the door, I think the BA and AA seat skeleton is identical, but American has positioned the table more prominently when retracted. There was still just enough knee clearance for me when in a relaxed position, I'm quite tall remember, but it did make the seat feel a little more claustrophobic than the BA club suite. And under the table is the dreaded foot cubby. It looked a little wider than BA's, but I'm happy to accept that it's the same. I was in the front row, but there was no space bonus from this, as my seat was identical to all others. A pre-departure champagne was offered and accepted, served in plastic, which isn't premium, but I think is a pragmatic decision given the challenges of serving whilst preparing a plane for departure. Although most other airlines seem to manage to use proper glasses for this service. Anyway, cheers. The safety video played, American has gone for dull and practical rather than flashy and or celebrity laden. And seat belts on, as the seat is angled towards the window, you're required to have an additional measure beyond the simple lap belt. BA has chosen an over the shoulder extra belt, AA has deployed an airbag into the lap belt. I don't really want to picture what happens to your lap if the explosive charge in that belt ever goes off. We pushed back pretty much on time, but it took a while to taxi around to the runway. I did get to see how much bigger Qantas's A380 is than their 787, although both fly about the same distance. And it was very rainy at a busy time of day, so it took a while for our turn to come, but we were into the sky soon enough. Not a nice day in London. The amenity kit had the essentials, socks, eye mask, ear bungs and some potions, plus a non-essential item in the form of an ochibori, which is Japanese for hand towelette, probably a handy thing to receive, literally. Delivered in a box, which I suppose is more environmentally friendly than some sort of bag, most of which just end up in landfill, although the abundance of single-use plastics inside the box undermines those green credentials somewhat not something you'll take and treasure as a souvenir of the experience. The loo. Some wood effect panelling, but no bonus consumables, which would amplify the premium ossity-ness of this business class experience. Here's the menu. Pause the video for a closer look. No choice of starter, and three carnivorous options for the main course, plus one option for the veggies, which is a little spartan in terms of options perhaps, especially as there's no extra options available to choose pre-flight, except of course for the special meals. Quite a narrow range of spirits were available, and no wine list was offered, all of which loses American another mark, or three, in my scoring. The table descends from its prominent position and expands to make a good large surface. You can get out of the seat with the table deployed. A tablecloth was distributed. I could only conclude it had been designed for use on a smaller table, it's a bit silly, and it's another mark lost if I'm scoring harshly. I had a long day ahead, so I decided to go for a glass of wine rather than a mixed drink to start. There were two red options, a Merlot and a Cabernet. Hey, it's an American airline after all. And I went for the Cabernet, which was decent without being exceptional. Without a menu, I have no idea now what it was. To start, I had no choice but to go for the Tataki Salmon, but fortunately, it was excellent. Really, really nice, and that salad wasn't half bad either. Then for the main course, or well, the entree, as the Americans insist on incorrectly calling it, I went for the braised beef. Beef rather than steak, for reasons previously discussed. In-flight catering really suits slow-cooked beef, and again, this was nothing short of excellent. And to finish, of course, I went for the sundae. 
I don't have a sweet tooth, but the attendant offered me one with everything, and I couldn't resist. Again, it was really excellent. Overall, this was one of the best meals I can remember receiving in business class on a plane. After dinner, I decided to give the entertainment system a spin. Noise cancelling headphones were provided, which were certainly weighty and did a good job, although remember, I have moderate to severe hearing loss, so I am never a reliable correspondent on this particular topic. There was a good range of movies and TV shows on offer. The touchscreen wasn't perfectly responsive, but you could also control your selections via the handset. And of course, as I was on a tier point run, as soon as I saw that Up in the Air was available, I had to watch it. Sadly, I have never been mistaken for George Clooney when I've been up in the air. I said the gate area had been quiet, and that was because the plane was virtually empty, behind business class at least. The forward business cabin was perhaps 70% full, but the rear business cabin had only a handful of passengers. Behind that was the premium economy cabin, three rows of 242 seating, so 24 seats in all, of which I think seven were occupied. Then economy was perhaps 10% full, Hard to see the actual passengers as they were all lying down across the middle block of seats. I asked the crew about this and they said that the service to Boston had only very recently been reinstated and the resumption hadn't been well marketed. On my adventure I also found the business cabin's snack area, no booze on offer, but sustenance if the meal hadn't been enough. I obscure her identity but the light loading meant that the crew could catch up on their reading. I helped another finish their crossword. I was initially a bit bothered by seeing this, but it really had no impact on the quality of service delivered to anyone. Indeed, another crew member described this flight as being like a Christmas present delivered in February. I didn't want to sleep on this flight, part of my jet lag management strategy, but I did test out the flat bed. I'm assured it's the same seat carcass as BA's club suite, but it did feel a little shorter. My feet were flush against the foot cubby in this shot. Speaking of which, it was a smooth walled cubby without annoying protuberances, but it is still a little constricting to the taller passenger. And as with BA, it's easier to sleep on one side than the other, as your knees have nowhere to go in this starboard seat if you sleep routinely on your left side. And the seat's shell gives good privacy when in bed mode. I had thought I'd spend the rest of the flight watching something worthwhile like Oppenheimer, but when I saw Austin Powers was available, I decided that nuclear war could wait. I enjoyed it with the gin and tonic, and I also enjoyed watching us race an Air Lingus Airbus through the sky, although the pollution it was kicking out was a bit of a concern. And about an hour before landing, there was a second meal service, more at the snack end of the scale, which was fine, given we were in the air for only a few minutes over seven hours. A toasted beef and brie sandwich with accessories. Not up to the standard of the first meal, but it really hit the spot. And down into a chilly but clear Boston. This is one of eight flights I booked as part of my tier point run from Dublin to Los Angeles and back, so it's a little misleading to focus on the cost of this one flight. But if you apportion the total price I paid for the flight based on miles flown, this leg cost about 400 quid, which is exceptional value for the experience received. And that experience was really very good. It was one of the best flights I've had since I started the channel. A good seat. BA's is probably slightly better, but American's benchmarks well against the other options out there across the Atlantic. Exceptional food, good drinks, albeit from a limited menu, indeed a partly invisible menu as there's no wine list. And a great crew. American Airlines crew can be a bit hit or miss, as I referenced in my intro, but this team was really good. Helped no doubt by it being an extremely stress-free flight for them due to the light passenger load, but that gave them time to deliver a great experience to the passengers who had joined them, and they could still catch up on their reading and their puzzles. One flight is not a large enough sample to draw broad conclusions on an airline's overall offering, but it is a large enough sample for me to conclude that I'd be happy to pick American Airlines again for a transatlantic flight, particularly for a day flight when the food and drink is most important. Indeed, BA's ongoing inconsistency in their offering probably puts American just ahead of BA in my estimation, which isn't something I thought I'd be concluding when I'd arrived at Heathrow that morning. So thanks for watching, give the video a like if you enjoyed it, and leave me a comment, would you consider American based on this? Please subscribe if you're new, and if you'd like to support what I'm doing more directly, there is a Patreon account, link in the description below. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.